Welcome back to the series. Uh, today I'm going to test the power supply under load. I got myself these uh, large wattage resistors uh, with the resistance values appropriate for loading each of the three power rails more or less close to the maximum rate uh, of the fuses. Significantly lower, like 33% lower, but uh, close enough to see if the switching noise uh, will be improved and also to test the components to see whether they will survive uh, producing enough current and voltage under actual load or, or whether they will blow immediately. And as it turns out, I immediately lost the 12 volts and the minus 5 volt lines when I turn it on uh, under load. I'm now checking the fuses to see if something as simple as that is, is, is the problem, but they all show continuity. So when I finished just testing continuity, I thought, well, there's something else going on here. I changed the multimeter to voltage mode, I turned the power supply on, and now I want to check the voltage potential from ground on both sides of each fuse. And there's a reason for that. These slow blow fuses that I'm supposed to use Sometimes they blow in such a way that uh, uh, continuity checks out, but they don't pass the voltage. Look, the, uh, one of the sides of that fuse is, is, has a 12 volts uh, potential and the other side is at zero. It's not passing the 12 volts. Uh, the inner side is 12 volts, the outer side is zero. I'm checking now for the 5 volt fuse and I, I believe I find 5.1 volts on both sides, so that fuse is okay. Uh, on the minus 5 volt side, it's 0 volts on both sides of the fuse. So the minus 5 volt line has, has another serious problem. I think the linear voltage regulator just blew on the real load. For the 12 volt line, we need to do a test. Let's replace that, uh, that fuse to see if the problem was the fuse. I'm putting a brand new slow blow fuse. Doing the test again. And we have the 12 volts back, so it's a strange failure mode for this slow blow fuse. It passes continuity, but doesn't pass the actual voltage it's supposed to pass. So I'm back to the um, minus 5 line uh, and you know, testing if it's 0 volts really on both sides of that fuse. In case that fuse has the same funny failure mode, then it's 0 volts on both sides. So the only thing left is the linear voltage regulator for the minus 5 volts that I would change later. It's good I did this test because it showed that that regulator would blow. Now I'm back to the 12 volt line. I put a 33 ohm resistor this time. So the voltage will be a few uh, 100 milliamps. It should be enough. I turn the power uh, supply on. Now I'll connect the oscilloscope to it because I want to see the noise uh, under load. And when I zoom in, reducing uh, um, the number of millivolts uh, per, per division, I get to see uh, the noise. At what you see there, you see? There is slow noise and there is the fast switching noise. That's the fast switching noise there. That's the moment of the switch. And this low switch noise is well under 50 millivolts peak to peak, so it's pretty okay. And for the switch part, it's a little over 50 millivolts. I'll take a picture and show that to you. Uh, I think it's peaking at uh, 75 millivolts peak to peak. I'd rather see 50, but that's okay. You know, under such a small load, that's okay. There you see it. it uh, the oscilloscope is AC coupled, so you only see the AC part, and it's about 50, uh, 75 millivolts peak to peak at the moment of the switch. And for everything else, it's well under 50 millivolts peak to peak, so that's okay. Now I'm measuring the actual average voltage, and look, it's not 12 anymore. It's less than 11 and a half under that small load. Why is this power supply? Uh, sort of uh, uh, gasping for air, even the 5 volt lines, it's, it used to be 5.1, uh, now it's 5.9, 4.9, it seems to be gasping for air. Now the issue could be something as simple as uh, having to adjust these two potentiometers here, this is for the 5 volt line, and this one here for the 12 volt line. Um, it could be as simple as adjusting these two potentiometers to get the right voltage under nominal load. In other words, with the actual load, the actual computer on, which I'm still not at the point of uh, being able to do. 
um, if it is this, then there's nothing wrong with the power supply. It's a matter of adjustment. I have changed the switching controllers for modern ones. I don't know whether this could have upset the previous calibration and I have to calibrate it again. It is possible. But of course, it, it gives me an uncomfortable feeling. Uh, this fuse here, although it's high rated, it's a slow blow fuse, so that, that's one thing. Uh, it could just, just be a peculiarity of the fuse that it began to open at just one ampere. But the fact that the voltage levels on both these rails, 12 volts and 5 volts, went down with a fairly low load of only 33 ohms on the 12 volt line and nothing on the 5 volt line, um, makes me uncomfortable. Why would the voltage levels go down if, if the power su supply is properly calibrated? Um, the suspicion I have, it may be just seeing ghosts, but the suspicion I have is that there is current leaking to ground inside the power supply. So the current that we get out, uh, these three lines here, and this is the minus 5 volt line, uh, um, goes on top of something uh, leaking to ground inside uh, the circuit. That's the suspicion. So. To address this, we have to do some tests, but first we have to understand the power supply. It starts with a normal transformer that will bring uh, the line AC to much lower AC, I suspect in the order of 20 volts AC uh, uh, on the two primaries, this is one, pr sorry, the two secondaries. This is one secondary, this is the other secondary here. Um, for the minus 5 volt line, uh, there is no switch mode regulation. It's just a simple fuse, a, a, rect a, a smoothing capacitor, and a rectifying diode. I tested this diode, it seems to be okay. And then there is just a linear regulator, uh, uh, um, Micro 78 MGU. This is a programmable regulator for negative voltages. You program it with this voltage divider here uh, by adjusting this potentiometer. That's how it's uh, programmed. In principle, uh, um, one could have used the 7905 to produce minus 5 volts fixed without having to program it. Um, we know that this one has failed. <laughs> it has blown. It's the only thing that could have blown uh, on the minus 5 volt rail. Um, I could in principle replace it with a 7905, but I didn't do it because this one is rated for up to minus 40 volts here on the input side. And the 7905 is rated for minus 25 volts on the input side. Probably is enough. I'm not sure what the rating of this secondary is. I could measure it, but I figured, you know what, I have new old stock. I will replace original for original. So this is the minus, four, minus 5 volt line. It's completely independent of the others. It has its own secondary. And I just need to replace this part here, which failed. Now, uh, here we have a little more sophisticated rectifier on the other secondary. This is a full bridge rectifier. Um, I toned out these four diodes. They should be okay. They have proper dropout voltage of 0.4 or something volts. Uh, these four smoothing uh, bulk capacitors here are brand new. So here you transform AC to DC and here you smoothen out the DC. And then you have the final step, which is regulation. In this case, you have two switch mode regulators. This for plus 12 and this one for plus 5. Both are based on this SG3524 uh, a switching controller that is still manufactured by TI today. Um, and the, the way they are programmed is through this potentiometer here. Actually, it's this voltage divider here that uh, programs uh, the output voltage. Um, and if you pay attention, you see that uh, this is the part that is different between the two regulators. The resistor values are different. Um, and then you adjust the trim potentiometer uh, for the fine tuning and of the voltage. Uh, these two things, this and this, are fairly independent from one another. They just share the bridge rectifier and the smoothing capacitors. So, the fact that voltage is going down here and here under a small load, again, it could be just adjusting the stream pots, these two, or it could be uh, current is leaking. But that they both go down, um, 
Current shouldn't be leaking from here, which is the common part. There is nothing to leak current to ground here. So it shouldn't be that. It sh I think it should be okay, but I will do some tests just to put my mind at rest. Um, this, this, uh, the collector of these two transistors here, these two transistors form a, a Darlington pair. Uh, it, it, it works as just one transistor. The only, the only difference is that the first transistor here amplifies this base signal to a larger base signal for the big transistor. And it is this big transistor here that works as pass. It passes the current that will, will be consumed by the computer or the monitor at the 12 volt lines. So these two here uh, are just a Darlington pair. You have the same Darlington pair here. They are responsible for providing enough current. So the place where you could have most dangerous current leak is if the collector of these two uh, uh, transist transistors in the Darlington pair, if that collector is somehow leaking to ground. Um, you have the same situation here. If these collectors, if this signal is anywhere leaking to ground, then you could have an internal uh, virtual load in the power supply. So when you add this current here, you're not adding these currents to zero, you're adding these currents to whatever was already there in the form of leakage. Um, this is a bit of a stretch, but this is what <laughs> I am afraid. Um, I will tone out uh, these diodes again, because the easiest path to ground, the most obvious path to ground, is if these diodes here have failed. They should allow current to go only this way. Uh, but if they, are allow if they are allowing current to come down this way, then look, you have a straight path to ground via a 0.0, .0 ohm resistor. To what resistor? But very low resistance. So if these guys here are leaking, uh, you get a lot of current leakage to ground on both uh, rails. So that's the first thing to look at. You may not find it by just toning out the, the diodes. I already did it. I will do it again just to make sure. But I will use voltage injection to make sure. Uh, and that's a delicate topic because it's not something you should just do if, you up, if you're going to apply voltage to your circuit with the circuit still off. You need to make sure you know what you're doing. I'm going to apply 12 volts here from my uh, uh, bench power supply because 12 volts is the volt you get on this line anyway when the, the power supply is on. And on this line here, I'm going to apply what it gets anyway, which is 5 volts. And I'm going to apply that from my bench power supply. Um, I will connect the bench power supply to the common ground. And then when I turn it on, if I observe current flow more than, I don't know, 100 milliamps, 200 milliamps max, if I observe more than that, then there is serious uh, leakage in this power supply. Now, what is the danger of doing um, voltage injection is that although you put 12 volts here on this line that already has 12 volts when uh, normally regularly anyway the rest of the circuit will not be biased as it normally is for instance the these two transistors here are pnp transistors so if their bases here are floating at under than 12 volts less than 12 volts then current will flow through this pn junction here and here because remember, it's P and P, positive, negative, positive. So if, if the collector is at a higher potential than the base, current will flow into the base from the collector. And then uh, this one here goes really nowhere. This chip is, is not on. Uh, and then there is a major resistor here, 2.7K. So this will be a trickle. But this one here, look, it goes through only 100 ohms and then loads very large bulk capacitors. So this current here could be significant even if everything is working. <laughs> you see, I don't think by injecting 12 volts I'm going to damage anything. I'm going to do it very shortly anyway to avoid any unnecessary risk. And what I expect to see is up to 100 milliamps because, you know, this is... 12 volts here, let's suppose this is floating at 2 volts, then you get 
10 volts pushing through this through a 100 ohm so you get 100 milli 100 milliamps uh, uh, when you do that that that's what i'm thinking um we will see um let's just do the test i will apply 12 volts here 5 volts here and observe the current i get uh, on my bench power supply um if it's several hundred milliamps then i know there is leakage if it's under the uh, on under a hundred milliamps then i know it's it's okay it's just leakage there is other leak there, there sorry it's not leakage it's just the circuit uh, polarized in this way uh, that is uh, uh, drawing that current there is another uh, current draw through this line here it's a very obvious one uh, it's a large resistor here so it will be a it will be a trickle here to ground goes down to ground here the same thing here 5 volts through 4.7k this will also be a trickle so a little trickle here a little tri a little trickle here uh, a larger trickle there uh, up to 100 milliamps i'm not worried at all so let's do this test uh, and see what happens so let's test this. I connected my bench power supply to the 12 volt collector of the Darlington pair, connected the multimeter so we have an idea of the voltage. My power supply is set for 12 volts and maximum 200 milliamps. When I turn it on, you will see that the current will reach the maximum while it's charging the capacitors. There you go. And then it goes down to the actual level. The voltage is 11.9 volts and we have only 19, 18 milliamps. Uh, and that does not explain the voltage drop that we were seeing under load. So this is not a problem. So I'll turn it off and I'll do the same test on the 5 volt line to uh, eliminate that possibility as well. Uh, first, I, of course, I have to reprogram my bench power supply to 5 volts. I'll keep the, the current limit at 200 milliamps. There's no need to charge the capacitors any faster than that. And if it exceeds the limit uh, uh, on an ongoing basis, then it means that we have a problem. That there is a lot of leakage. So I moved uh, a, a positive uh, terminal of my bench power supply to the 5 volt collector now of the pass transistor. I'm moving the multimeter around so we get to measure the 5 volt rail now. And again, when I turn the power supply on, you will see that the current will uh, peak. And then as the capacitors and parasitics charge, it will converge to the actual current. It's going down now. 7 milliamps at four, 5 volts. 4.96 is 5 volts. So no, no appreciable leakage there either. Those diodes are not the problem. Um, I'm not continuing this test because it may cause some damage if I keep doing this. So I'll move on now to, to offline tests with the board off. I'm going to check uh, with the multimeter in diode mode. Uh, the, the, the first transistors of those two um, Darlington pairs. So I'm measuring now the voltage drop from emitter to base. Uh, it's 5.9, which is pretty okay. And now collector to base, 5.9, very consistent, very okay. Moving over to the other transistor. Emitter to base, 5.9 again, <laughs> that's pretty good, very consistent. Collector to base, 5.8. So this is pretty good. I will revert the probes now, reverse bias the junctions. So now we get should get a higher voltage, but from emitter to base, remember, there is uh, there, there are resistors there. So yeah, we get 0.7 volts. That's expectable it's because the current is flowing through the resistor. And then from the collector to base, we get a much higher voltage. The capacitors are being charged there. So again, emitter to base, that's okay. Um, now on the other transistor, reverse biasing uh, or base to emitter, it goes through that resistor, connecting base to emitter, and then base to collector, growing voltage because it's charging the capacitors. So those two transistors are also okay. We move on to the larger best transistor of the two Darlington pairs, those two there. The collector is the chassis, emitter and base can only be access, accessed from the back of the board. Uh, those are the emitter and bases of uh, the two transistors. I'm putting the negative probe on the base 
and then let's see the voltage drop from collector to base. It's charging the capacitor should end at 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Yeah, 0 0.47, that's pretty okay. Let's test the other side, collector to base. Should end more or less the same, more or less at the same place. 0.46, that's pretty okay as well. Now let's check emitter to base. Now that's very low because there is a 100 ohm connecting emitter to base. So that's consistent uh, uh, with, with the circuit as well. These measurements are in circuit. I'm now going to uh, continuity mode. Uh, this is just to make sure that there is no short circuit. And there you go, 99 ohms. That's that resistor connecting emitter to base. That's why we were seeing such a low voltage. The same on the other Darlington pair. That's completely consistent. So now one final test, um, those two large pass transistors are connected to that large heatsink, their chassis are the collector and the heatsink is the base, so there is an insulator, a mica insulator separating the chassis uh, from uh, the, um, the heatsink. I'm testing the resistance now from collector to the heatsink, collector to base to make sure that, that the mica insulator is still working fine and didn't deteriorate. And there you go, several thousands of ohms charging the capacitors. The more the capacitors charge, the more realistic the measurement is. But past 5 kilo ohm, I don't need to measure anymore. The other one, it's the same thing. As the capacitors charge and we don't have that current flow to charge the capacitors, we get a more realistic reading of the resistance. And it's well above uh, 5k as well. So it's all good. Uh, I was a bit paranoid about it. I hope this power supply is okay. I would just now pull the old linear voltage regulator of the minus 5 volt line. It's this one, little regulator from 1977. I'm going to replace it with new old stock, uh, with a new old stock part from 1982. This one is busted when I put it on at a nominal load, it blew. So it was good I did that test because it would blow in circuit anyway. So there comes the new one. I'm comparing the date codes now to make sure that the new one is newer. It's new old stock anyway. I'm using their Captain uh, insulator because the chassis of this regulator is also not ground while the heatsink is. So I have to uh, isolate the chassis from uh, the heatsink. Um, put it in, it in now, tightening that little screw. So there is good thermal contact and because there is a crack on that uh, heatsink, uh, not, a, not a defect, just that gap on the heatsink, I'm adding some thermal paste there to optimize thermal conductivity uh, as much as I can. That's what you just, uh, just saw me do there. And now we go solder it, first with a little bit of flux, waiting for the soldering iron to come to temperature and then applying solder. I forgot to add, <laughs> to put my solder fumes extractor. I immediately felt the difference. So now it's safer. I'm using lead-free solder, um, but uh, even that, you know, if you have a fumes extractor, why not to use it? I do want to live long and prosper. So that's the reason. Cleaning it up and then I'll check for, for short circuits between adjacent terminals. Uh, no short circuits, the connections that should be there are there. So we are good to, to test it. I'm going to, I mean, test it as a whole. I'm going to put the board back. I added some, some tin um, jackets to those uh, wires, uh, and that's the new regulator. Now, why I added the, the tin jackets, somebody commented saying, well, if you use those connectors, screw terminal connectors that you're using, uh, they are only good or, or, or rated for solid core wires, these are not solid core wires, the solder can melt. Well, that's the case if you're operating at 230 volts uh, AC, this is more like 20 volts AC, but fine, I put those little metal jackets on both sides and now it's compliant to all the regulations, even if it's not really a significant thing. So, putting, connecting those, those jacketed wires now again. I've added these, these connection boxes and the extra wires because I didn't want maintenance of this power supply going forward to have to involve desoldering wires from the PCB each time. That, uh, that, that's, uh, that's conservation work. You don't want to create a situation where you will wear off the board without the desoldering. 
So now we are ready to test. I'm going to test uh, the minus five volt line first. Multimeter is in place. It is on. Now I just have to turn on the power supply. Noise we already tested before. Minus five volt spot on without load at least. But this is a linear regulator. It, it will be the same with load. Now a final test of the other two, that's the 12 volt line, 12.02, that's spot on without load. With load we might have to adjust the trim pot. And the 5 volt line, spot on without load. With load we might have to adjust the pot. So, you know, I'm still a little bit worried about this power supply, but this is it. I'll go forward and do a final test with it. So this is it for this episode, I will proceed and assemble the computer back and test the power supply with the real load. If I've missed something, if you're screaming at the screen because you know you've seen or you noticed something that I missed, please let me know in the comments below. Either way, I'll be seeing you next time. Take care.